All right, so welcome to Lightweight Cryptography. So first I will start by explaining why we need Lightweight Cryptography, okay? So, but we are going to use this, especially focusing on Internet of Things. So first we need to talk about what Internet of Things is. Unfortunately, there is no good definition. Nobody knows what it is. And also the name doesn't mean much to anybody. But I like the definition of NIST. So this picture is actually from taken from the NIST special publication 800-183 Network of Things. So instead of Internet of Things, they prefer to use Network of Things, which is a even larger uh, uh, term because not always all of these devices are connected to the internet, right? Sometimes they are in their own network. So. Uh, in the Internet of Things, we have some sensors, but we also had this in a you know, wireless sensor network. So how this looks at the problem is as follows. We have some sensors, okay? They are gathered in clusters like C1, C2, and these are communicating with aggregators, okay? So these are more capable devices. And here we have some e-utilities, which actually, can perform some operations on the data you get and then make some decision and actually then force these decisions to sensors or you know some other devices. So here's an example. They check two values if they are, you know, after you apply the function f to input x and y, if the result is larger than 200, it says the set wing flaps to 10 degrees and so on. So this is actually what we generally have in mind when we talk about network of things. The problem is that these small devices sometimes are really small in terms of capacity. So they don't have much uh, computing power. They don't have much memory, but we still communicate with them. And we want those communication to be secure, right? We want to use cryptographic measures for that. So this is where lightweight cryptography comes into play. We want uh, good algorithms, but they are still uh, applicable to small devices. For instance, we, you can apply modern algorithms and use them on these very small devices. Sometimes it doesn't fit. Sometimes it fits, but you don't get the best performance and so on and so forth. So let me summarize the need for lightweight cryptography as follows. First, as I mentioned, we need encrypted communication. We do it for security. Most of the IoT solutions does not come with uh, security in mind. Some of them doesn't have any encryption at all. Sometimes they don't have proper authentication. A lot of IoT devices generally just trust any uh, device in the same network without any authentication and so on. So first aim, of course, encryption. But then it will be nice if you had authenticated encryption. This is the topic we are going to talk about when we talk about NIST uh, lightweight encryption standardization process. Here you authenticate the data, okay? Also with this the person. Another thing that we need to focus is battery life. Most of these devices work on batteries. So if you have uh, you know, an algorithm that consumes a lot of resources, then it will, your battery will not last long, right? So you want to have a very lightweight algorithm so you still have long battery life. This is actually what we suffer in our mobile phones, right? So you have to charge your iPhone five times in the day. This is because of this. If you had very nice uh, lightweight algorithms, we wouldn't bother with this. Okay. Another thing is energy. Again, uh, it looks like with the battery, but actually energy is somewhat different. It actually uh, measures how much energy you need to, you know, sometimes. Uh, use the device because in some devices like smart cards, you don't have a battery on it, right? You take the energy from outside. Also with the passports and so. But if you notice when you give your password to the officer, it takes a few seconds for them to process that data, right? But in your smart cards, you instantly authenticate yourself. The difference is that in your passport, the operating system boots this up. So it takes a lot of time and you know, so, so it is a more complicated process. 
Whatever, another thing we need to focus is latency. So you might have a nice algorithm, but latency might be high. By latency, we mean that the moment you generate plain text, which you want to you know, uh, uh, secure, then the time it takes to produce the ciphertext is measured as latency in terms of encryption. Okay, so if it is too long, then maybe it wouldn't be helpful because in this IoT cases, sometimes we want to do some measurements with the sensors and get the results maybe tens of times in a second, right? If the latency is larger than this, then it wouldn't work, right? Another thing is throughput. Sometimes in the case of lightweight cryptography or IoT, we don't need much throughput, but still, if it is too low, then you, you wouldn't like it, right? And finally, side channel resistance. This is actually one of the most important things, and we actually need a single course just for this, okay? Although an algorithm might be secure, its implementation may not be secure, okay? In the side channel attacks, we don't break the algorithm, we break the implementation. So it can be based on the power you consume with your device, maybe the noise it makes, maybe the you know data it uh, catches, and so on and so forth. So there are many, many different ways to use side channel information and platform attacks. So for this reason, we would prefer to have an algorithm or encryption algorithm, authenticated encryption and so on, that provides all of these things, okay? And as you can imagine, it is not an easy job, right? All right. So here's a good picture that summarizes some of the uh, problems that cryptography solves. For instance, for confidentiality, that is the most basic thing we need. And we solve this by encryption like block cipher and stream ciphers. You can also provide confidentiality by using public encryption algorithms like RSA or Algama. But you can also use authenticated encryption algorithms, which also provides confidentiality, but also data authentication. So in this uh, lightweight competition was about authenticated encryption. So we will be focusing on this part a lot. Data authentication can also be provided by hash functions, message authentication codes, but this also solves the problem of entity authentication. But with the digital signatures, we also solve the origin non repetition. So this is like a, a big part of the cryptography, but there are also a lot of things that are not in this picture, like post-quantum cryptography, full homomorphic encryption, multi-party computation, randomness, and so on and so forth. So it is a big picture, but just uh, know that we have some goals like this, and we can solve them, okay? But of course, we would prefer to do it also on small devices. That is the idea. So let me briefly explain what kind of cryptographic algorithms we have. We have some algorithms which are keyless, like cryptographic hash functions. They don't use any key. But we have some keyed algorithms where we use them for generally for encryption, like in the symmetric key cryptography, we use secret keys for both encryption and decryption. In the asymmetric key cryptography or public key cryptography, Generally, we have two keys, public and private. You know the private one, and you publicly announce the public one. So secret key algorithms use the same key material for both encryption and decryption, hence the name symmetric key cryptography. There are three types of algorithms in this category. Block ciphers, which we are going to focus a lot. Steam ciphers, these are encryption algorithms. Message authentication codes, these are not encryption algorithms, but they use a secret key to provide authentication, message authentication, okay? So this actually summarizes what I said. Block and steam ciphers are encryption primitives while the message authentication code is used for data and data origin authentication. But these are not completely different topics, okay? We can use a block cipher to build a steam cipher and the message authentication code or even a hash function. So in order to understand all of these topics, actually we have to understand them one by one and then reconsider the whole process. Asymmetric key cryptography is somewhat different. There are different types of algorithms here like key agreements and the Fiamman key exchange is one of the most famous one. Encryption like RSA, Algama, all digital signature algorithms like DSA or elliptic curve digital signature algorithms and so on. So 
Also, let's uh, talk about some terms, uh, cryptographic terms to be on the same page. So let's talk about a crypto system or a cipher, okay? So here, the plain text is what you want to protect. It can be any data, a message, it can, it can be your WhatsApp message, but it might be also your voice when you are calling somebody, okay? So it might be acquired like a file in your computer, but it might be, you know, generated during the communication like while we are talking, okay? So this is the thing you want to protect. A crypto system is a pair of algorithms that convert plain text to cipher text and back, like here. So cipher text is the encrypted version of the plain text, and cipher text should appear like a random second. So we assume that the communication channel channel is not secure. So for this reason, we send the cipher text to this channel, assuming that the enemy captures it. But we are confident that capturing the cipher text does not provide any information about the plain text because they don't know the secret keys that we use for this process, okay? In the symmetric key crypto systems, you have a single key you use for encryption and decryption, sometimes in an identical way, sometimes order of the round keys might change. So here, the uh, what we actually say is keys used for encryption and decryption are identical or closely related. In other words, one can be obtained from the other in polynomial time if you want to you know, explain it in more scientific way. So let me explain what a block cipher is. Block ciphers operate on b-bit blocks of data. So plain text is divided into b-bit blocks. Each block is encrypted by a k-bit secret key to produce b-bit output. Output blocks form the cipher text. So instead of dealing with a variable like input, you divide it into b-bit blocks. So you design your algorithm that works on this b-bit, OK? That's a block cipher, and the chosen key is actually a permutation from two to the b elements to the two to the b elements. So there are many different permutations. The space is really huge. So designing a block cipher actually is choosing a good subset of these permutations. And nowadays, we choose the block size as 64 bits or 128 bits. Rarely, we choose 32 bits in some lightweight designs. But secret key should be at least 128 bits to be secure against current technology, OK? But algorithms sometimes come with different uh, choices. So for instance, in the advanced encryption standard, you can choose these three options. So for personal use, this is enough. For military use, we suggest this one. And as far as I know, no one uses this one, OK? So let me uh, give a short history on block cipher. So this is one of the most famous block ciphers, data encryption standard, designed by IBM in the 1970s, based on an earlier design by FaceTime. Uh, in 1976, NSA tweaked the algorithm by changing its S-boxes. So at the end, the algorithm looked like this. Block size is 64 bits. Secret key is 56 bits and it consists of 16 runs. So instead of designing a complex algorithm, you design a round and you repeat it many times so that it is easier to analyze the security of the cipher, okay? So this algorithm is currently known as a data encryption algorithm, DEA, because if you keep using the word standard, people keep using it. This is the problem. So it took a lot of time for us to explain to people that this algorithm was long broken and you shouldn't be using it. So uh, it became useless after 1990s. It's, it's short key susceptible to brute force attacks. So, but people kept using it for some time. Later on, we had a, of course, in the process, we observed many different uh, block ciphers, but Currently, the most famous one, and actually the algorithm that is responsible maybe the 99% of encryption in the whole internet is advanced encryption standard. Original rain, name is Rainda, uh, designed by John Damon and Vincent Raymond. So the algorithm name is coming from the you know, names of the designers, two Belgian cryptographers. So this won the AES competition and became the NIST standard. There were some other finalists like Serpent, Two Fish, RC6, and Mars. You can find these algorithms in many libraries like OpenSSL and so on. 
But AS had the block size of 128 bits. It supported three different key lengths, and the number of runs actually depends on this key length. Okay. So far, there are a lot of attacks, but known attacks are ineffective. So many modern cryptographic algorithms are designed for desktop computers or servers. So thus, they may not fit into many IoT devices, or when they did, their performance may, may not be as good as expected. I'm saying this because I'm saying that AES is really a nice algorithm and it is secure. So uh, you might get the uh, intuition that we can use it in lightweight cryptography for IoT, but you wouldn't get the you know good latency, good throughput in every device. This is why we also still need lightweight cryptography. Okay. Also, the last thing I want to say about this, uh, lightweight cryptography does not mean short keys. So in the past, people designed lightweight algorithms, but they kept the key length small. But if you keep it small, it only provides you short-term security. And you know, you cannot measure how short term it provides you the security. So let me explain what we mean by short keys. So recall that I told you that this had 56 bit keys, right? So this means that since a bit can be zero or one, this means that at most you can generate two to the 56 different secret keys. So an attacker might capture a plain text block and a cipher text block, and one by one, encrypt the plain text block, which every possible key and check if it matches with the cipher text they captured. So in the worst case scenario, they have to try this many encryptions. So this number looks big, but actually on a modern GPU performing two to the 32 encryptions in a second is really easy. With the new ones, maybe you can achieve two to the 36 even. Okay, or 32. So less than a year, a GPU can perform this many encryptions for this. Okay, so you can break this with a few GPUs in a few days or weeks. Okay, so for this reason, people in start increasing the key size for algorithm like present. It supports 128 bits, but also it supports 80 bits. So there are many IOC standards which supports 80 bits. But two to the 80, although we are increasing it exponentially, it's still not that much of a big number. Again, a GPU can perform like two to the 32 encryptions per second, and you have two to the 24 seconds in a year. So it will take like a few billion GPUs to break this in a year, okay? For this reason, this is why we suggest two to the 128. So you might say that, okay, if these are going to broken, maybe this will also be broken. But the thing is that even if you use the every computational power of the devices in the world. And if you can perform two to the eight encryptions in a second, in a year, this means that you can perform two to the 104 encryptions. This means that you will need two to the 24 years, which means 16 billion years to break the system. And a human life is not that long, right? And you cannot pay the electricity bill after that time. So this is why we say that stick to 120 bits at least, but smaller than these variants are can be broken. But of course, if you increase it like this, you can see that it increases exponentially. So these numbers are really huge. And this is what we call military-grade security. Okay. 